Good morning and uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the Pavement Rehabilitation Design Goal webinar. Uh, Troy Kaiser and I are going to be your presenters today. Uh, Troy is a senior consultant with Benchmark and I am the operations team leader. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping um, reminders for you. One, uh, we are recording this webinar, so just wanted to let everybody know that. And then two, um, the chat feature has been turned off, but the Q&A section is turned on. So if you have any questions uh, throughout the webinar today, we encourage you to please put those questions in the Q&A section. We will be monitoring questions and we will do our best to answer as many of them at the end of the presentation. If for some reason we don't get your uh, question answered, uh, Troy or I or another team member of Benchmark will reach out to you offline to make sure that we get your uh, questions answered. Uh, so thanks again for joining us today. Uh, so just want to share a little bit about Benchmark before we dive into um, the details of the presentation today. Uh, so Benchmark is a roof and pavement consulting company. Uh, we were established in 1983. Uh, we are an independent and privately owned corporation. Uh, the main services that we provide are evaluation, uh, design bid, construction phase services, and program management as it relates to roof and pavement assets. We have two offices. One is in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. That is our corporate office. And then we have another office in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And uh, we have 25 satellite locations throughout the United States. And uh, today we have 120 employees. So what makes Benchmark unique? Uh, our three uniques are technical excellence, client focus, and organizational health. Uh, so when it comes to technical excellence, we deliver independent and market-leading consulting services that our clients can trust. Uh, we pride ourselves on being client-focused, so uh, we gain a deep understanding of our clients' goals to create a long-term value a shared long-term value, and uh, organizational health. We are a cohesive team with a unified purpose that delivers results our clients can be confident in and count on. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, our promise to our clients is that we will keep your best interest in mind. Uh, so with that, we're going to jump into uh, this uh, pavement webinar on pavement rehabilitation and design goals. We're going to be talking about site-specific design benefits. Uh, we are going to touch on the importance of the base during the design project. We're going to talk a little bit about parking optimization, and we've got four case studies we're going to share with you today. Uh, so I want to kick things off with a um, quote that Troy shared with me as we were uh, gearing up for this presentation, and I thought it was very fitting. Uh, the strength of the pavement system must be greater than that of the traffic loads and deficiencies in the subgrade. And so that is an official uh, Troy Kaiser quote. So we're gonna uh, start with uh, design goals. And so uh, during the design phase, there's uh, two kinds of sets of goals. So there's the owner's goal and then the designer's goal. So we're gonna touch on both of those today. Uh, when it comes to the owner's goal, some of the things that we feel like um, our clients or the owners you should have in mind are, um, Improvements to your pavement condition and site safety, uh, making sure that the design is cost effective, that the appropriate design method is used for the usage of the pavement. We're going to touch on that a little bit more. Uh, it's always important to maintain facility operations at all of the facilities during a pavement project. And so phasing is a key component uh, during the design phase. A lot of times people think, well, phasing comes into play during the construction phase, but you really wanna make sure that it's clear to the contractors at the time of bidding uh, what the phasing requirements are so that they can take that into account in um, the estimating of the project. Um, it's always key to make sure that any design where there's any ADA uh, stalls that you are adhering to ADA regulations. Uh, parking lot optimization, we're gonna share a couple of examples of that with you today. And then of course, it's always important to try to stay within the um, project budget. So in addition to the owner's goals, uh, if Benchmark is designing a project, these are some things that we feel like as the designer or engineer of record are important. Uh, it's really important for us to understand um, the existing pavement and the subgrade conditions. And so uh, that's typically done through geotechnical exploration. Uh, we always have a goal of having no change orders, or I should say little to no change orders with a project. 
Uh, we want the bid documents to be as accurate as, as possible at the time of bidding. And uh, also want to make sure, similar to the phasing, that the, any quality control or quality assurance guidelines that you are expecting the contractors to adhere to, that those are listed in the specifications so that the uh, contractors are aware at the time of bidding uh, what costs they need to include because the proper quality control and quality assurance, there is a cost to that uh, during the construction project. Uh, it's key to make sure that the design is const constructible, so uh, constructability, and uh, also want to make sure that the owner, the designer, and the contractor are all happy with the final product. Uh, so really, at the end of the day, uh, the owner's goals should really be part of the designer's goals uh, as you're working together in a collaborative approach for your next pavement design project. Uh, so we're going to jump into our first poll question today. We do have four of them for you. Uh, so we would uh, encourage you to please participate. Uh, the first poll question is, how do you currently manage your pavement design projects? So we're looking for you to choose one of these internal team. Um, so that means you do it in-house. Uh, you use a consultant or engineer, a contractor, or maybe you don't have any funds for design projects. Uh, so if you could take a minute to please complete the poll question, uh, we would appreciate it. All right, we'll give you another second here and then we will close that poll and uh, we'll share those results with you. All right, it looks like the poll closed. Uh, just a reminder, again, the question was, how do you currently manage your pavement design projects? 30% uh, of you manage your pavement projects in-house, 48% utilize a consultant and engineer, 19% contractor and 4% don't currently have any funds for, uh, for any funding for your design project. So thank you for uh, participating in our poll question. All right, so we've talked about the importance of knowing the uh, owner's goals and the designer goals. So now we really wanna touch on some of the key components that should be taken into account on your next design project. Uh, and the first is understanding the existing pavement conditions. And so we reference here the PACER rating, uh, which is from the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, and it rates pavements on a scale of zero to 10 from poor condition to excellent condition. And you can see here on the screen, we have a couple of ratings. Uh, so if your pavements are a PACER rating of uh, 10 to 7.5, that's typically an excellent to very good condition. Uh, and when your pavements are in that condition, there's usually very little to sometimes no preventive maintenance that is needed. So again, you wanna understand the condition of the pavement to understand the right scope of work. Uh, the next category would be a PACER rating of 7.4 to 5.5, and that would be good to above average condition. Um, these types of pavements are gonna be those pavements where preventive maintenance is critical to extending the life of the pavement. So some of the things you might take into account when your pavement is in this condition is uh, crack sealing. Uh, you may need to do some smaller pavement restoration, um, some patching. There may be some cur curb and gutter restoration that's needed, uh, potentially some under drain. And uh, also this is where you may um, do pavement marking. So uh, freshening up those initial pavement markings. Uh, the third category is our fair to below average condition. So that's gonna be a PACER rating of 5.4 to 3.5. Uh, and typically when your pavements are in that condition, this is where uh, pavement restoration, um, so pavement um, patching is needed as well as overlay. So a lot of times this is that uh, prime condition for an for a asphalt uh, overlay to take place. Um, and then uh, sometimes with those asphalt overlays, you may include a paving fabric, and we are going to talk about that today as well uh, in one of the case studies. And then that fourth category is going to be your poor to failed condition, a PACER rating of 3.4 to 0. Uh, this is typically where uh, you're going to look at um, scopes of work that include partial depth or full depth reconstruction. Uh, and it's really gonna be dependent upon the borings and what the geotechnical exploration shows. But you would never want to overlay a pavement that is in poor to fail condition. Uh, otherwise you're just throwing good money away. 
So once you know the condition of your pavement, the next thing you want to take into consideration is the pavement usage. So there's a lot of different types of usage uh, for pavements out there today. Could be a typical parking lot um, that just sees standard car traffic. Uh, roadways, it's always really important to, to know um, what kind of traffic do the roadways within your facility see, because a lot of times if you have a multi-use facility, your roadways see anything from uh, car traffic to um, garbage truck traffic, you might see truck traffic, and so it's really important to understand those traffic loads. Uh, truck docks are obviously going to be designed different than a parking lot. Uh, you may have those sections or areas within your facility that are combined usage, uh, and then it also, is it a business or retail setting? Uh, and then light industrial and heavy industrial. So lots of different types of pavement usage, and it's really important to know. And this is where um, having somebody on the site to physically assess the conditions and watch the traffic usage, watch the cars and the trucks coming and going, uh, really helps to understand what the usage is of those pavements. Uh, so after you take into account the usage, uh, one of the things that we wanted to touch on is parking optimization. So we've got a couple of examples here uh, in this top image here. Um, this is actually a uh, truck parking area for one of our clients. And um, after uh, COVID, they actually needed to turn it into employee parking uh, due to an increase in manufacturing um, and having more employees at each shift. They needed more um, stalls. And so you can see here by optimizing the layout within this existing area, they were able to gain 122 stalls. Uh, and so that was a really big gain for them. Um, the example here at the bottom of the screen, um, that shows actually where uh, we optimized the stall layout and the traffic for safety purposes. Uh, so this was an area that had a lot of pedestrian um, traffic. And uh, we were able to gain 31 stalls by going from angled parking to a standard 90 degree parking. And so sometimes what we have found is that our clients aren't thinking about um, how to optimize the existing layout. And the best time to do that is when you're moving into your next design phase. Uh, so we're gonna jump into poll question two here, which does have to do with um, parking optimization. Um, so question number two is, do you have any areas throughout your facility that would benefit from optimization of your existing footprint? Uh, the answers you have to choose from are yes, no, or not sure, hadn't really thought about the optimization opportunities until today's presentation. So if you wanna take a couple of minutes here to vote, we would appreciate that. <laughs> And we will be closing the voting here soon and share those results with you. All right, so it looks like the poll has closed and uh, it looks like nine of you um, have uh, areas throughout your facility that may benefit from parking optimization. Um, or it looks like 35% of you, I'm sorry, um, said yes. 31% said no, and 35% said not sure. Uh, hadn't really thought about it before today. So again, we appreciate you taking the time to uh, answer that poll question. All right, so the next category that you wanna take into account is the service life. Um, so what are the expectations for the rehabilitation service life of the new pavement that you're designing? Um, maybe we do actually hear sometimes from our clients, I only have four more years to work. So as long as it gets through my retirement date, uh, it is a joke, but we do hear that a lot that people are like, I only have a couple years left. Um, or maybe you're looking at a five year to 10 year pavement. Uh, you could be looking for a 10 to 15 year or a 20 year pavement. Uh, it is the uh, life expectancy is, is greatly going to affect which rehabilitation method is appropriate. So it's really important that you as the owner and uh, whether you're doing in-house design or working with um, a, an external consultant that you really understand what the life expectancy and service life is um, to take that into account. Uh, so we're gonna jump into poll question number three here that has to do with service life. Uh, so just curious, uh, how many of you out there that are joining us today do have internal design standards uh, when it comes to service life? And if so, uh, what is the life expectancy that you try to design to? Is it five to 10 years, uh, 10 to 15, 
15 to 20, or you don't currently have any internal design standards. So if you'll take a couple of seconds here to vote, we would appreciate that. At least some people might be wondering why you would design a pavement for less than, you know, 20 years. And uh, what I've run into is sometimes they're going to be selling a property and they just want to fix it up enough to make the sale easier. Um, or they don't own the property. Maybe they just rent the property, but they're in charge of maintaining it. So those are some examples of why you may not want to uh, build a pavement that lasts as long as possible. Yeah, absolutely, Troy. Or sometimes it's that they just don't have the funding to build a 20-year pavement um, and they're doing an overlay instead, which doesn't typically have a 20-year lifespan. Uh, so thank you for participating in the poll. Uh, it looks like 4% um, of you said 5 to 10 years, 35% uh, said 10 to 15, 23% 15 to 20, and 38% of you uh, do not have uh, internal design standards today for the life expectancy. So thank you for uh, participating in that poll question. All right, so uh, ultimate design goals, you wanna make sure that you're designing for site-specific intended use. Uh, we like to use the term in-house at Benchmark, no cookie cutter approach. Uh, it doesn't matter if we're doing two facilities for the same client, both facilities have their own uniqueness and you wanna take into account uh, anything that is site-specific when putting together those design documents. Um, at Benchmark, we like to say, if we're involved in the design process, we like to design it like it's our money. So we wanna make the best use of the funding that our clients have available. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're utilizing cost-effective and proven techniques within the uh, pavement industry. And when possible, you wanna try to delay uh, your pavement overlays by performing that necessary preventive maintenance. Uh, and then also delaying your reconstructions by performing overlays at the right time. Uh, reconstructions are extremely costly and can cost three to five times uh, more than an overlay. Um, and so you wanna make sure that if you, can, um, if you can take a proactive approach to managing your pavements and design those overlays and install them, uh, it is going to save, save you um, money year after year. Uh, so before we jump into the case studies, I did just want to share with you kind of one last uh, slide here. Uh, so this is a uh, pavement deterioration curve, and uh, this was designed for a pavement that the asset value is estimated to be a million dollars. And you can see here at the start of the uh, pavement, we start out with the pavement being in excellent condition. And then at about year five is where you have that first maintenance touch. And then you can see there after that first maintenance touch and check mark, you can see that the condition actually improves just a little bit. And then the condition, the con condition continues to deteriorate. And so then around year 10 or 11, uh, typically recommended that you would do another sort of maintenance touch. Um, again, the pavement is um, going to improve in condition just a little bit. Uh, and then typically around that 15 to 17 year mark, give or take, um, site constraints and conditions is typically when an overlay is needed. And so if you can, um, if you can do that overlay at the right time, you're going to reset the condition of that pavement back to that very good, maybe even excellent condition and, and be able to extend the service life of that pavement and save yourself money um, year after year. Um, so in this particular case study, you can see it's on average about $32,000 per year, but that doesn't mean you're spending money every year. That's what it equates to um, for that life expectancy of the pavement. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to Troy here, and he is going to jump into our first case study today. Thanks, Elise. Uh, our first case study is going to be a partial depth asphalt reconstruction utilizing pulverization method. And uh, asphalt pulverization is defined as a method of pavement rehabilitation that consists of pulverizing the existing asphalt and mixing it with a portion of the underlying base. And the goal is to create a more structurally sound base by recycling the existing pavement uh, so that it becomes part of the stone base and, and increases the thickness of that stone base. So what are the advantages of pulverization? It recycles existing pavement that you've already paid for instead of just hauling it away. It reduces the trucking costs for hauling materials out, whether it be full excavation or just the asphalt, and then the trucking costs of bringing new materials in. It reduces material disposal costs. There's always costs opposed, uh, associated with uh, getting rid of materials. There's tipping fees or dump fees. Uh, reduces the cost of bringing new stone in. 
Um, it can improve the site drainage because during the pulverizing process, we actually regrade that pulverized material so we can make improvements in the drainage. It, like I said, it increases the structural strength of the pavement cross section by increasing the, the stone base uh, before the new asphalt or concrete goes on top. And it decreases the construction time frame because pulverization is uh, a lot faster than doing full excavation and then bringing new stone in. So here's a cross section, uh, 3D view of a, a pulverized project. Obviously on the bottom, you have your existing subgrade. Uh, right on top of that will be the aggregate base course that was left in place that wasn't mixed with the pulverized asphalt. And then you have that thicker layer or blend of the existing asphalt with some of the stone uh, base all blended together. And then on top of that, we build our new asphalt system, which usually consists of two lifts, a binder lift of asphalt, and then a surface lift. Or in some cases, you can we can switch over to concrete and put a concrete pavement on top of that new base. So our project is a me medium duty industrial parking lot. Uh, it's in the Chicago area. It's about 20,000 square yards. It was in poor condition when we first got there to evaluate it. The owner needed to do it in two phases because they needed to maintain parking uh, for their employees during the project. And the scope of work that we came up with was curb and gutter replacement where it's removed and report at a higher elevation to take into account the additional materials that we'll be adding. Uh, pulverizing the existing asphalt uh, 12 inches in depth in this case, uh, under drain install installation, uh, regrading, like I mentioned before, for better drainage. Uh, we did repairs to some of the storm sewers, uh, catch basins uh, and structures. And then of course we installed the new hot mix in, uh, pavement, which was four inches thick in two lifts. So here's the actual plan uh, for the project. As you can see, um, we have about 10 islands that we need to re-pour um, to get the, to raise the elevation. The surrounding, uh, the surround, the area around the parking lot was basically turf, so we could raise those grades without any problems. Uh, there are some sidewalks that come in from the building. We did not have to change those elevations there because the slope from the sidewalks to the first set of catch basins was adequate enough. But if we did want to raise those grades, we could have removed sections of those sidewalks back 20 to 30 feet and report those as well to take advantage of the pulverizing. Uh, also on this plan, you can see the dash lines. Those are the under drains we added uh, to drain the sub subgrade and sub base of uh, subsurface moisture. Um, here's the uh, bid form that the contractors had to fill out. You can see it's very detailed. Uh, we wanna make sure we include everything that the contractor is gonna have to do that uh, takes care of our goal of not having any uh, change orders or overruns because of things that are forgotten. Um, and also we've included some contingency items for undercutting, for repairing any soft base that we may come into, because uh, we always want to have a good base to put our new pavement on. So when is pulverization appropriate? It's appropriate when the existing pavement cross-section, the asphalt and the stone is thick enough to support the new pavement structure. And to get, find that out, we have to do borings. They are required. So we know what those uh, thicknesses are. Um, the elevations uh, can be raised at the perimeter to allow for the new pavement thickness. So if we have a pavement that might be surrounded by buildings or uh, sidewalks that can't be changed, uh, that would be a, a case uh, where we couldn't do pulverization. Uh, where the pavement is too deteriorated, where we, it's beyond repairing or doing an overlay. And the parking lot has to be large enough to accommodate the necessary equipment. Pulverizers are very large. Uh, they're expensive machines to run. So smaller lots, it's just not uh, cost effective to pulverize smaller lots. It has to be a pretty good sized parking lot or roadway. So now we'll go into poll question number four, which relates to pulverization and the question is would pulverization be an option at uh, any of the lots or roadways at your facility so we'll take a little time here to let you answer this question all 
Okay, let's get those results. Okay, so, well, half of you said that you do have parking lots that would be good candidates for pulverization. That's a good thing because that'll save you a lot of money. 36% uh, are not sure, and 14% uh, said no, too many uh, constraints. Okay, moving on with, uh, here's the actual one page of the boring log uh, for this particular site. And in this particular boring, um, it shows that there's eight inches of existing asphalt with five inches of aggregate base course. So we have plenty of material to pulverize in place. Uh, the subgrade was stiff to very stiff. Um, so it's, it's a good solid base underneath that. That's important as well uh, for pulverizing. But it does say there that there is some moisture that is moist, and that's why we included under drain to hopefully weep that moisture away from the subgrade and subbase. So here's some photos of the project. Here's the existing conditions that we found when we first got there. You can see it's in very poor condition, um, severely cracked, a lot of alligator cracking. You can actually see the moisture weeping from the pavement from underneath. Even though the asphalt's eight inches thick, it was still the moisture was still coming up through it. And here's the first uh, part of the construction. You can see in the uh, photo on the left, the curbs have been taken out and replaced with new curb at a higher elevation. Now, it may seem that that's pretty expensive to remove curbs that aren't damaged and raise them, but uh, the cost savings by doing the pulverizing more than covered the cost of uh, raising these curbs up. And then here's the, pulver the pulverizer in action. As you can see, the material behind the pulverizer is very fine. So in front of the pulverizer, you can see that we've spread a uh, two inch size clear stone over the top of the asphalt before we pulverized. And that was to add some larger stone back into uh, that mixture to help add strength uh, to the uh, to the new base course. And here the crew, after it's pulverized, they fine grade to the new grades. Um, on that light pole, there's a orange paint mark that is the finished grade. So it shows how much that that grade is being raised to accommodate the new asphalt. So once they fine grade it and they're compacting and rolling it there on the left, uh, we did a, a test roll. What we did was took a fully loaded dump truck and we ran it over every part of this new base looking for uh, deflections. Um, now there might be minor deflections in the surface just from loose material or dry material. What we're looking for is a rolling of that material. If it rolls, we know it's soft or wet underneath. And we talked about the importance of having a good base. Um, so any areas that we encounter like that, we paint out those areas. Uh, and then we have the contractor use the undercut contingency item to remove those item, those soft material and replace it with good dry material make sure it's solid for our new pavement. And so here's our completed uh, paving. It looks really good and you can actually see the new slope and in the improved drainage. And on the right, you can see phase one is done and they're using phase one now for parking. And on the left part of that photograph, you can see the pulverizer has just started. Uh, the parking lot has that layer of white two inch clear stone on top that's being blended in for the extra strength. So the uh, project turned out very well um, and the owner saved a lot of money on this one. All right, thank you, Troy. I appreciate that overview. Uh, we're gonna jump into another uh, case history here. This is an asphalt overlay project. Uh, so you can see here, here's a diagram that shows the uh, overlay project. So um, what the cross sections look like. So you've got your existing crushed aggregate base followed by the existing uh, asphalt uh, binder course uh, the existing asphalt surface course. You can see some of the initial cracking that's taking place uh, and installing an asphalt level course, uh, the uh, geotech geotextile interlay fabric, and then uh, topping it off with uh, the asphalt surface there. All right, so this project was a light duty retail parking lot, um, was about 17,500 square yards. Uh, the pavement was in above average condition at the time that we did the design. Um, this was done in three phases of paving, four phases total for the project over a two week time frame. 
Uh, and the general scope of work included uh, minor curb and gutter repairs, uh, milling, some base repairs, asphalt level course installation, a paving grade fabric, and an asphalt surface course. Uh, so you, this is a copy of uh, what the pavement rehabilitation design project looked like. Uh, I want to call your attention to the phasing plan here at the top, the colors. Uh, you can see in this phasing plan, uh, the first phase is the concrete work. In this particular project, that was subbed out to a uh, concrete subcontractor. Uh, so they came in, did all the initial concrete work first, and then the asphalt paving was done in three different phases to be able to maintain uh, operations at the facility. Uh, so when is an uh, overlay appropriate? Um, when the existing pavement structure is adequate, again, this is where um, the base really comes into play. And the only way to determine what the condition of the base is, is to have borings done uh, to learn more about those conditions. Uh, the, draining need, the drainage needs to be adequate, as well as the, um, the surface of the current asphalt. So there can be minor raveling or polishing taking place, and then slight to moderate cracking. Uh, if you've got, um, like the project Troy did, an asphalt overlay would not have been an opportunity for that pulverization project. The pavement was too um, in too failed of a condition. Uh, the existing curb and gutter needs to be in good shape. And then uh, the existing uh, stall layout uh, works for the facility. So again, this is where you want to take into account that parking lot optimization, making sure that do we have the right flow? Do we have the right number of car or truck stalls? Uh, before we go in to do that rehabilitation project. Uh, so this particular uh, project, we did do borings as well, uh, just to confirm what the asphalt thickness was, as well as what the uh, base course was and the condition of that. Uh, so this is a photo of the condition at the uh, time that the design was done. So you can see that there was some uh, surface raveling and minor cracking that was taking place. Um, so uh, one of the key steps to a successful overlay project is the milling portion of that project. And so there's three different types of milling. There's the full depth uh, removal of asphalt. So that's where the contractor is going to come in and uh, remove the, the existing asphalt is removed down to the aggregate base. Uh, partial depth removal of the asphalt. So that's where you determine a certain thickness of asphalt is going to be removed. And that's included in the plans and specifications or a slope is set um, with the electronics on the mill to maintain the proper uh, slope across that lot for drainage reasons. Uh, and then also there is um, wedge milling. So this is where um, the edge or the perimeter is milled to match the existing curb and gutter uh, of, the, of the pavement. So here are some photos from this um, project uh, for you here. So you can see uh, that they're milling along the uh, front walkway as well as the uh, front interior ring road. Um, and they are milling the long distance across the lot. So whether it's in this roadway or if it's in the bottom photo there, uh, they are milling the long distance, which is uh, a key to success during the construction. Uh, so you can see here in this photo, this is where uh, the contractor proof rolled and marked the soft areas. Uh, so this is where we've got soft base and we want to make sure that we take care of that base uh, before we install that asphalt overlay. Uh, so the next photos here show where uh, the contractor is actually choosing to mill out and prep the base repairs with the mill. They had the mill on site. Uh, so they went ahead and milled out these areas where the base repairs were needed. Uh, then they clean the area and pr proof roll it. Uh, so now we are uh, contractors installing the base repairs here at the front of the lot. So uh, the base patching should be completed before the leveling course begins. Um, and you want to be sure that the uh, that you're specking and that the contractor is using uh, the proper mix type, depending on the depth of those base repairs. So uh, Troy talked about allowing some of the contingencies in the unit prices. You want to make sure that you not only have a contingency for some of the uh, base patching, but that it you've included a specified depth. Uh, so the next phase of this project was the installation of the level course. So uh, the level course is being placed in the direction of the traffic. Again, you want to make sure that whether it's the milling, the level course, or the asphalt paving, when at all possible, uh, that the contractor's working in the direction of traffic. Uh, so with the level course, the uh, depth can definitely vary. And a level course is used as a really good foundation for the paving fabric. 
um, and also to help make any drainage improvements that might be needed um, with this asphalt overlay project. Uh, you can see here in these photos, so after that level course is installed, the contractor has multiple different sizes of rollers on site and they are compacting um, the pavement um, to make sure that the pavement gets the proper compaction uh, before we install the paving fabric. Uh, but before the fabric, uh, we need to install the uh, proper coverage of the AC for the fabric. So the AC is the liquid asphalt cement, and that is placed in a uniform coat over the level course um, after the asphalt has cooled before the paving fabric is installed. So this next photo here, you can see the paving fabric, um, the installation is complete. So you wanna make sure that you've got a good tight installation, that there's no wrinkles or folds in the fabric. Um, the uh, AC overlay and seam of the fabric look really good here on this particular project. And you might be asking like, wh why in this case, in this overlay project was a fabric used? Um, well, some of the reasons that you might wanna consider using a fabric in your overlay project is the fabric can really help to slow down the cracking. Um, and it also helps to prevent water from infiltrating um, beneath the soils of the pavement, which really help to maintain the strength of those soils um, and long-term prevent that frost heave uh, in certain climates. Um, so definitely something to think about is, is, an, is a fabric necessary or would it provide some value uh, to your next project. And uh, after um, the fabric is installed, then the installation of the surface course takes place. So you can see here uh, the, con the uh, constant use of a level by the uh, operation running the screws to control the asphalt depth. So they wanna make sure that they're keeping a consistent slope uh, for drainage. So uh, the slope and the drainage are key uh, to the success of the asphalt overlay project. And this is a uh, final overview of one of the phases here. You can see that the pavement marking is complete and uh, we're just getting ready to uh, open it up to traffic. Okay, so the third case history is a partial depth asphalt reconstruction. Uh, this is a heavy industrial site. It's actually a distribution center for a nationwide company. Uh, it's in the Atlanta area. Uh, the areas in blue are their asphalt, uh, basically driveways uh, for the uh, semis to run. Uh, the site is only 10 years old, but is already failing. So we were sent down there to see what's going on and to come up with a plan to rehabilitate it. Um, the truck entrance is on the right side there. They had already started rebuilding some of that already with concrete. Um, the large purple area there, it was still existing asphalt that was failing. We wanted to get that uh, repaired, but you can already see the other two smaller purple areas were areas of concrete that were already failing. And those had been repaired since uh, the site was built 10 years earlier. Uh, phasing was a big part of this, uh, this design. It's a very busy facility. The dry docks on the north side of the building they could give us a little bit more, they could give us more docks than they could. The docks on the west side of the building where they're refer or refrigerated area, they could only give us, they had to give us less of those. And also we had to maintain traffic. So the outside, we had to maintain at least one lane at all times. So the phasing includes that outer uh, part of each phase. Uh, what we came up with with meeting, we sat down with the owner and talked to them about how to best do this project. And because they had a second entrance, which is on the south side there, that wasn't being used because the other uh, vendor that rented this building had moved out, we decided to have traffic flow in only a counterclockwise direction. So the semis came in the, the existing truck entrance and left and that by that south entrance. And that allowed us to get bigger work areas than what we could have had otherwise, which uh, you get better pricing from the contractor and keeps the site open for the owner. So um, here's some photos of what we encountered when we first went out there. We did do borings. The borings showed only about four and a half inches of asphalt over eight inches of stone. Um, very thin uh, asphalt for a truck area. The subgrade was dense to very dense with no indication of moisture. So that was uh, encouraging. 
and then also the concrete areas we did do some borings in the concrete areas they were uh, the roadways were eight inches of concrete over four inches of stone uh, and the concrete dolly pads were six inches of concrete over six inches of stone so we took all this data that we collected and uh, uh, the data on the traffic and the from the cores um, and our head designer took that and analyzed it and um, he uses a computer program where he can put different thicknesses in and there's different values for each type of material. And here's the design that we came up with. In those asphalt trucking areas, we were going to do 10 inches of excavation or milling, put in six inches of new asphalt binder and two lifts, two three inch lifts, a two inch intermediate course on top of that, and then a final two inch course. And then in the concrete area, which is mainly the, the truck entrance, which gets a lot of traffic, there we were going to do a full excavation with a subgrade fabric to keep the uh, subgrade material from infiltrating up into our stone base. And we're going with a six inch stone base with eight inches of reinforced concrete. Um, our assumption was, is that the, from the borings that the stone base, the, the subgrade was going to be very solid, but we wanted to be careful uh, and be prepared. So we included 750 tons of stone as a contingency for undercutting and stabilizing any of the uh, subgrade. So here's some photos of the construction. The photo in the upper left is the truck entrance and you can see how busy this site is. It's just loaded with trucks kind of trying to get in and out of there. But that allowed us to work on one half of that at, without having to do smaller phases. In the, in the lower photograph there, you can see they're removing the uh, failed concrete and then the photo on the right shows uh, the completed concrete. What we found when we did the concrete removal, it was inadequate for uh, reinforcement, didn't have enough reinforcing steel in it. Um, and that's why we anticipate that that eight inches of concrete did not hold up. Uh, the contractor was very aggressive, which we like to see. Um, so they did the milling operations in the asphalt roadways areas at night um in preparation for paving during the day um paving during the day is always better you get a better product it's easier to see how it's turning out so um just a couple photos of that milling operation so then as morning started um the milling operation leaves a nice stone base ready to be paved on except for some small details in the corner so they use skid steers to uh, work out the corners knock down any high spots and then rolled it uh, with an asp or with a stone base roller, which is in the lower left corner there. And as soon as that uh, area was uh, proof rolled and approved for the asphalt installation by us, then they went ahead and the paving crew showed up in the morning and they started that uh, first lift of asphalt, which you can see on the right here. Now, interestingly, we did not use any undercut on this site. Uh, the base was as hard as uh, the, the boring showed. Obviously, borings are just a snapshot, but in this case, uh, they were very accurate. So then after the binder lift was installed, the uh, intermediate lifts went on top of that. That went very well. Uh, the photo in the upper right, you can see the different layers. Um, and also, uh, density testing was done during the installation. Uh, the design called for tack coat uh, or like a glue coat between the different lifts of asphalt. That's the photo in the lower left. Uh, they're using a tack buggy full of that uh, tack coat and spraying it between the lifts of asphalt. A uh, tack is not very expensive. It, I call it a very cheap insurance to make sure that those lifts adhere together and don't separate. Uh, I did mention we didn't use any undercutting, but um, the photo in the lower, lower right shows that bypass lane that we had to keep open for traffic. Uh, sometimes we had to put semis on that before we really would have liked to just to keep the facility operating and we did have some shoving of that upper lift and this is where we we uh, milled those areas out and patched those shoved areas before we placed the final surface and here's the surface being installed and the striping uh, being done and it turned out really well and uh, it was an exciting project to be involved in and, and uh, it should last many years for these people all right, thank you, Troy. Uh, so we're gonna jump into our uh, fourth case study here, which is a concrete reconstruction project. So uh, this one is a heavy duty truck dock. The project size was just over 3000 square yards. 
Uh, you'll see some photos here in a minute. The condition was poor. Um, we did have to do this in multiple phases um, it, because we couldn't, we can only shut down so many dock doors at one time. And the general scope of work for this heavy duty um, concrete reconstruction was subgrade separation fabric installed, nine inches of crust aggregate base course and eight inch thick reinforced concrete. So pretty heavy duty cross section there for the uh, truck traffic it was gonna see. Uh, so here is uh, photos of the pavement condition. You can see here there was uh, significant ponding water in areas and asphalt was actually being used in some of the dock areas. Uh, and it was not a sufficient cross section of asphalt uh, for the traffic that those dock areas was, were, was seeing. Uh, in addition, the concrete outside this area was also uh, significantly failing. So you can see here in these photos some uneven um, surfaces that cause for a rough ride and uh, this particular site, even some product being damaged. Uh, so during the project, the first phase of it is that demolition phase. So you can see in the top photo here, as well as the bottom, uh, they are um, removing the existing concrete that was five to six inches thick. And there was also about four inches of base material. Uh, so this is what we found during the uh, demolition phase here. We actually found, I don't, if you can see in this photo, the mesh is at the bottom of the pavement structure. So that really doesn't do any good. So we wondered why this concrete cross section was failing. Uh, well, it was because while they intended to do the right thing by using mesh, it was not installed properly uh, during the initial uh, installation of that pavement. So this really does no good uh, with the mesh at the bottom of the concrete pavement structure. Uh, so then we move into the installation phase once they've uh, completed the demo phase, and this is where the uh, subgrade separation fabric and the aggregate are installed. So you can see in the top photo there, uh, the fabric has been installed, uh, and then they are actually in the process of installing um, that aggregate on top of the fabric. Um, the bottom photo here shows the density testing that's taking place um, on the aggregate base. So that is a critical step to making sure you're getting the proper density uh, on that aggregate base before moving on to the uh, installation of the concrete. Uh, so uh, once the density testing is done, um, the next part of this project during the installation phase was the chair placement. So that the chair placement is taking place in the top left photo. And then uh, the bottom right photo is uh, the steel being installed as well. So you um, are installing the chairs first to make sure that they assist with making sure that that steel placement is in the right area so that we don't have what happened in the photo uh, a couple of slides ago uh, happened with this project. Uh, so you can see here, they're actually starting to install the concrete pavement on the top photo there. And you can see where the chairs and the uh, rebar have been installed. Uh, as well, and they're pouring the concrete over that area. Uh, and then in the bottom photo here, you can see where the relief joint, they're sawing the relief joint over the dowel baskets. Um, and so that's kind of the kind of the, the end piece of the installation phase. Um, and so then um, what they're doing here in this photo is they are installing the backer rod for the sealant in that top photo. And then uh, in the bottom photo, what you can see is the finished rubberized sealant um, being installed uh, on that new concrete pavement. Um, so project update five years later, you can see here um, the pavement, the concrete is in really good shape. So you can see concrete all the way up to the dock doors. Um, and really, you don't really see much cracking taking place. You see a few um, oil spills and some gravel here um, from the trucks coming and going, uh, but the concrete pavement is in really good shape and even five years later uh, was not in need of any um, preventive maintenance yet. All right, so we are gonna close things out here before we jump into questions with uh, Troy giving us an overview of rehabilitation um, design keys to success. Thanks, Elise. So uh, design considerations for success, proper investigation in, into the existing conditions, we try to get as much site history as we can. If we can find the existing plans and specs or somebody on site that knows uh, what was done, we collect that while we're out there doing our investigation. Uh, we stress the importance of geotechnical investigation, doing those borings. It's impossible to do a, a site-specific plans and specs or design without doing borings. They're, they're critical. Uh, site surveys, shooting grades on the site, um, so that we know where the water goes and where we can make improvements, like on that pulverization project, by shooting grades, we knew 
uh, we needed to where we needed to make changes to improve the drainage and doing utility locates, knowing where the utilities are helps us with that under drain installation. Is there anything going to be in the way that's going to impede our design? Um, so that's important as well. And then having a proper design after we do that investigation, having adequate pavement cross sections that are designed to uh, overcome the traffic and the deficiencies in the subgrade, um, setting grades for the new pavement, including, which is really critical in a lot of areas, the ADA areas have to meet slope conditions, and then having detailed specifications for construction so that the contractors know exactly what to do and that there won't be any uh, cost overruns due to uh, change orders. And then, of course, including quality control and quality assurance uh, to make sure the materials we place uh, will uh, perform as we expect them to perform. So um, having a proper design leads to successful construction. Uh, it leads to proactive coordination with the facility, um, a phasing plan to minimize oper operational impacts. Uh, the detailed construction plans and specifications leave no questions. Uh, we like to have a quality contractor with the sufficient machinery and manpower to get the project done. And of course, quality control through uh, compaction testing of the aggregate uh, and the asphalt and concrete testing dur during installation, make sure that that concrete performs as expected. So at least started out with uh, one of my quotes. So we'll finish with a couple of quotes. One is from the asphalt pacer manual. The rate at which a pavement deteriorates depends on its environment, traffic loading conditions, original construction quality, and original material quality, along with the interim maintenance procedures. And those are the things that go into a proper design, all those uh, um, items. And then uh, the final one would be from Paul Schmidt. Uh, Paul is the founder of the paving division of our company. Um, he said, uh, asphalt or pavement design is blending the science of engineering with the art of construction. And, and that is that is so true. So with that, we'll move on to uh, any questions. All right, Troy. So there are a few questions here. And if you've not gotten your questions submitted, please go ahead and um, submit your questions and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can. Uh, Troy, one of the first questions um, in regards in regards to phasing, uh, are there cost implications to adding phases or removing phases? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there there absolutely are cost um, implications. The larger areas of work we can give the contractors at any one time is going to allow them to get the work done quicker, which is going to save the money and we'll get better pricing in the beginning of the project. Uh, if we have to break a project up into many small pieces, it's it's going to increase the cost because they're going to have to mobilize more often uh, and their production rates are going to go way down. They're not going to put down as much asphalt or stone per hour as they could if they had a wide open area to work on. All right. Thank you. Um, next question, uh, Troy, what is the price comparison? We don't need exact numbers, uh, but uh, maybe average or some percentages. What is the price comparison of a mill and overlay and pulverization? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, the, the cost of a structural overlay is going to be less than pulverizing because when you're pulverizing, you're installing a full depth pavement. So, you know, for a car parking lot, three to four inches of asphalt. For a truck area, eight inches of asphalt uh, or a concrete area, you know, a pretty thick concrete where your structural overlay is going to be basically um, a leveling course and, a, and maybe an a inch and a half or a two inch uh, surface. So your, your overlay is going to be cheaper um, I don't know what the percentages would be, uh, but it would be significantly less expensive than the pulverize pulverizing. Okay, but thank it, you. but but it's got to be done at the. You can't overlay a pavement that's in poor condition. That's the difference. You, it, I'm a big proponent of structural overlays where it actually increases the 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 pavement uh, struck you know strength. Um, but um, if you do it at the wrong time, if it's too late, the pavement's already gone, it's just going to crack prematurely and fail prematurely. So it's just wasted money. Okay. Awesome. 
All right. Uh, next question. It's kind of a long question here, Troy, but um, uh, can you talk through the normal maintenance repairs that should be completed on roughly a five-year basis to present needing to do full replacement? So um, the person asking the question is asking about like when you should crack fill, seal coat, um, when to decide if crack filling is needed um, and when to seal coat um, or when to throw in the towel and just replace the pavement. So do you want to just kind of talk maybe back to that uh, deterioration curve? And obviously it's different with asphalt and concrete, but it uh, sounds like they're maybe asking about asphalt pavement here. Right. Uh, the most important thing you can do, and <laughs> going back to what uh, Paul Schmidt, our founder, um, I actually worked with Paul when we were contractors many years ago. He told me the, the three most important things about a pavement are base, base, and base. So we've got to keep water from getting into that base because water softens up your stone and your uh, subgrade clays or whatever your subgrade might be. Uh, so crack filling is your number one preventative maintenance or crack and joint sealing of concrete. We've got to keep the water from getting underneath that pavement. Um, so... About the five year mark, you're gonna to wanna to crack fill a pavement. About that time it gets enough, uh, what we call random cracking. And if you fill those cracks and keep the water from getting underneath, those cracks should not uh, spread in, in, in a, what happens is if you don't fill that crack, water gets in there, softens up once underneath and then you get secondary cracking around it and it becomes what we call an alligator cracked area where it looks like the skin of an alligator. Well, when it, once it becomes alligator cracked, then you have to remove that area and patch it, which is more costly. So that crack filling, it not only does it protect the pavement, but it saves us money down the road because we're not going to get that alligator cracking where we have to do a patch. So uh, uh, once you get the crack filling done and the joint sealing done, if you do end up with areas that settle or become over cracked or alligator cracked, then patching would be your next maintenance item. So crack fill, then patching to maintain that pavement and make it last. Um, and then just keep crack filling and patching until it's not cost effective. Then you wanna to go to the overlay phase um, at the right time, go to the overlay phase to improve your pavement, get that extension. Um, and then uh, obviously if a pavement gets uh, beyond that and then you have to go to full reconstruction. I hope, and, I, answered, um, I, hope I answered that question. <laughs> Yeah, we can definitely follow up with the person that asked the question to make sure um, that we have answered it. Uh, Troy, do you want to touch just a little bit on the difference between crack filling versus crack sealing or kind of benchmarks take on that and the importance of routing out certain cracks and why you would want to do that so you're not uh, throwing good money away? Yeah, the difference between crack filling and crack sealing is with crack filling, you just you basically take an air compressor and blow debris and clean the crack out and then you just install or drizzle i call drizzle the crack filler into the crack crack sealing is after you clean it out you take a router and you route and make the crack bigger uh, with a routing machine and clean it out and then fill it with the sealer after you do that it sounds counterproductive why would you make the crack bigger but that router creates a reservoir for more filler to go into so that as the pavement expands and contracts the there's enough filler in there that it expands and contracts with the pavement and doesn't pull away from the sides with crack just crack filling where you drizzle it in as the pavement uh moves or expands and contracts it'll generally uh pull off of one side and it's not sealing properly and water will still get in there so we're a proponent of crack sealing which includes routing of the cracks thank you troy um, and one more question that came in on crack sealing in particular is, is crack sealing needed or is it worthwhile in all climates? Yes, it rains everywhere. So yes, keeping water out from underneath your base. Um, it, uh, Elise mentioned that uh, water in your base uh, will frost heave in Northern climates, which is true, but it's gonna soften up your stone in your base no matter what your climate is. So um, it's effective nationwide. All right. Awesome. Um, so there are a couple of questions I'm not sure we're going to get to today, but we can follow up uh, with those appropriate people uh, offline here. There is one housekeeping question that came in regarding um, 
a certificate for PDH documentation, there is one PDH credit available. Uh, and I do believe an email will come out from Benchmark uh, with a link for you to download it or a copy of that certificate. So uh, look for something from Benchmark. Uh, if not today, um, I, I'm assuming it will happen this week. So. Um, so for those of you, thank you for joining us today. We're right at uh, 12 o'clock, so we want to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, we certainly appreciate the questions. If you still have questions, um, I think there's two or three that we weren't able to get to. Uh, we will make sure that we touch base with those individuals um, offline and answer your questions. Uh, Troy and I's contact information is here on the screen. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out with any uh, pavement questions. Um, this is what we do all day, every day is uh, pavement management, and uh, we would love to talk with you or answer any questions that you have. So uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you.